Problem number one is, does anyone care about what you're doing, right? And for us, we found they did. And so the next problem was, right, okay, well now we have to serve this demand. So Richard, thank you so much for coming back on the show in our new studio. We had you on last time, we were talking about your company, Juro, which is your contract management company. And a lot had happened then where you just closed a round of $2 million. And now you're going to tell us how you spent it all. Yeah. Well, New cars I, and apartments and I just took it straight into my personal bank account. Oh, yes. brilliant. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And you're yeah. retired now. <laughs> <laughs> so, I mean, look, thanks, thanks for having me again on the show. Um, yeah, so no worries. I think it's funny, when you raise that first round, it always feels like this huge achievement because you work so hard at it and you've kind of got to first base and then the money gets into your bank account. I mean, you get a call from the bank saying, hold on, um, there's money coming in. Yeah. Uh, there's something wrong. And, and then at that point, you realize, well, you've got to do something with the capital, but it's really getting you into this kind of scale-up mode. And that's mm. really been the, 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 work the, the main here. challenge that mm. we've been kind of grappling with is how do you go from startup to scale-up? When you, when you went to, to raise that money, obviously you need a scale-up plan, right? You need to... We need this two million dollars because you have to go from here to here, and here's our plan for going here to here. Did you stick to that plan, or when you got the money in, was it well, okay? Let's do something about it. Yeah, I mean, what's the phrase? Planning is uh, essential but ultimately useless, right? So <laughs> I think this is a truism in in startups because you, you've got to have some hypotheses, right? You've got to have an idea of where you want to go, and of course you can't really be compromising on the vision of the company. But mm. the kind of day to day reality, I think, is you're making a lot of micro decisions, right? And those yeah. decisions tend to relate to, well, am I going to hire this person or this person? And, and what's what's the right strategy for our for our sales and marketing teams, for example? So you kind of get into the into the, the nitty gritty, and as you do, of course, you realise more and more that you don't know anything, uh, and so you kind of make some mistakes along the way, and you just hope that you're making kind of eighty percent of the right decisions to get you ultimately to the to the end goal. What are some of the mistakes that you you made yourself? Because so many. Uh, where where to start? Um, so I, I think. Um, you know, when you're at the seed stage, you're still trying to really get to product market fit, right? So yeah. you're trying to find, you know, if there's someone, anyone who will find this platform useful and have willingness to pay for it, right? And so when you get into the first kind of batch of customers, I think the main thing we learned is we, we got customers very quickly in the customer's life cycle. And so we found once we got them on board, the next question was, okay, well, we've got a handful of these customers, but, you know, what's the universe of customers like those guys that we can kind of quickly scale mm. to? And so... We spent a lot of time experimenting around that, you know, ultimately we tend to sell to tech businesses, we tell to businesses who are processing lots of contracts, um, but uh, we tested some of the other sectors and just some just didn't work. So for example, we realized that really, really early stage startups just don't have a need for Juro. They just don't have enough contracts to kind of yeah. merit a system for managing them. So some mistakes over kind of who we go after. I think um, uh, hiring mistakes can always happen. It's always super hard to, to find not just the right people, but also what's exactly the right time to hire that person. You know, is it too early to hire a kind of manager here? Is it too too late? What What is it? So. I think a couple of mistakes around around that, but we, we've been lucky, and I think for the most part, we've kind of gradually gone towards our, our goal. So you acquired some pretty big customers since the last time we spoke, some huge names in the business. Do you think you could have closed that business without that funding in place, or was that was that completely essential getting those customers? Yeah, really good question. So I mean, the customers that have come on board in the last year, generally speaking, are, are real scale ups. So you know, Deliveroo, Skyscanner, Secret Escapes, Babylon Health, those kind of big brand names, and I think. When, when you're trying to sell to those customers as a really early stage startup, right, the first thing you need is that they must have an absolutely burning problem, right? So I always, I always use this analogy that if your hair's on fire and you see a brick nearby, you're still going to pick up the brick and you're going to bash your head with the brick to put out the flames. And it's a little bit like working with a super early stage startup is you, you just know the product's not going to be fully there. So in the really early stages, I think you're getting these customers on board to really come on a journey with you. You know, you're, you're solving something right now. They know what the roadmap is. They want to influence the roadmap. And ultimately, they know that where you're going is going to deliver massive value for the company. So yeah. I think funding helps in lots of ways. I think there's a trust element to it as well, right? Uh, I think, you know, it de-risks your cash flow to a certain extent for a certain period of yeah. time. So, you know, if you're a large business working with a startup, they're not going to go out of money tomorrow, for example. Mm. Um, I think the the second thing is obviously building the team to serve the demand, right? So problem number one is, does anyone care about what you're doing, right? And for us, we found they did. And so the next problem was, 
Right, okay, well now we have to serve this demand, so we need like a customer success team and we need to have, um, ensure we've got the right people kind of selling into these customers and then we need more engineers to serve the kind of the increased demand and increased load on the product. So I think that, that funding was certainly very helpful. Whether we could have done it without it, I mean, I'm always in awe of bootstrapped entrepreneurs. I always think this is the absolute coolest thing to be, um, but uh, I think for us, given the complexity of our product, it made total sense to raise and that just helped us move that a little bit faster. How has your position changed since you raised the money? Because when we uh, last met you, you'd think you had seven employees. Now you've got 20. You know, so there's always like, like it's, it's great to, to actually get money. It takes off a bit of the pressure, but it also adds even more pressure. So, so how has your position changed? I think I'm still fig figuring it out, to be honest. I mean, the yeah. role of a startup CEO is a very bizarre and strange and constantly evolving role, right? So the way I thought about it is when I started, I was really clear that I had to do everything myself, right? Mm. And so when it That's came... what you thought when you started? Yeah. So, mm. so for example, when, when, when it came to sales, I could have hired someone into sales straight off the bat. But to be totally honest, we didn't really know you didn't have a playbook around who we're selling to, how we're going to sell, for example. So, yeah. I mean, I closed, I think it was 350K in uh, annual recurring revenue myself. And it was a bit of a struggle for me. I mean, I'm, I'm a lawyer by training, right? I don't come from a sales background, but I think you just got to get your hands really, really dirty. Mm. And, and what that helped me do is when it came to hiring salespeople, I kind of knew what the questions were. And I kind of could see someone who was a ton better uh, than I was at doing it. And you could, you could just you're just more likely to hire the, the right person yeah. into that job. And I think it's the same for a lot of things. I think now, to the question of how it's changing, is I'm gradually getting fired from these roles, right? So yeah. it gives me great pleasure. But being when replaced I can be, by someone better, hopefully. Someone better, exactly. Yeah. So when I get fired from kind of leading the sales team, it's always a, a moment of joy for me, because that means that we've got someone in a kind of director level position who's able to really own the function. And so mm. that's happened to me with kind of marketing and sales and customer success. And now I can spend a little bit more time on hiring. I can spend a little bit more time on the strategy. Yeah. But I still spend, I mean, just day to day, an absolute ton of time with customers. I mean, I, a couple of weeks ago, we were kind of counting up the meetings. I think it was 17 meetings in the week with either customers or prospects. And so it's, it's that kind of work which I think you can really add value to as a, as, as a CEO, but also it's really adding value to your revenue and to your traction because you're, you're just giving that kind of love and attention which is unexpected in, in the kind of scale-up phase. I know uh, this is obviously, the money has obviously brought so much uh, acceleration to the company, right? But from what you, you used to be, as you used to be a bit of a jack of all trades, and now you're able to hire someone from, to cover the positions you were normally covering, have you really seen the growth like dramatically start to grow? Because now you've got someone full-time on sales, someone full-time on marketing, someone full-time on whatever it might be. So it's a really interesting question. So I, I think we've seen a curve, which I, I think other people have seen, which is as you kind of go away from founder-led sales, we actually saw just a little micro dip. So just for a few weeks, you're really having this kind of handover transition process yeah. where as a founder, you, you're always thinking to yourself, I didn't really know anything about this or I didn't really know anything about you know, product or sales. But actually, you, you have this kind of wealth of knowledge just from having done so much of it. And so it's a micro dip. And then you see the acceleration curve where you realize actually they are way better than you at doing that thing. It just takes a bit of time. And I think one of the hard things when you're in the kind of startup stage is you can't really afford to kind of be scaling things. You should really be doing things that don't scale. And then as you get into that phase of now just sort of scaling up, well, that's the main thing you're doing. So it's, it's really hard to know when to do that. And, and I think we got it pretty much right in sales and marketing. And as a result, we've seen a, a sort of huge uptick in demand uh, kind of going forward. For the founders that are watching the show, right, do you think you have a higher level of respect from the customer success team, the salespeople, the marketing team, the fact that you did it. You, you, so they can't turn around and say, you don't understand, you didn't do what, mm -hmm. I, what I'm doing, so you know I did in the beginning when it was actually tougher. Do you think that creates more of a level of respect among the employees? I'd like to think so. I mean, I think you've got this kind of balance, right? On the one hand, founders are famously micromanagers, right? And they're typically micromanagers because they've had to do everything themselves. And all of a sudden, someone else comes in and they've got a different way of doing things. So you have to kind of force yourself, I think, as a founder to just kind of take a step back and really trust uh, the people and the leaders in the organization that you've hired to do that. But I think on the other hand, to your point, yeah, absolutely. I think um, it's really hard to have you know, one-on-ones as I do with kind of leaders in the org every week and sort of ask the right questions. If you haven't tried it yourself, you aren't really read up on it, then either you've hired someone who doesn't know what they're doing, if they're thinking, well, you know, <laughs> well, this guy doesn't know what he's doing, but we're having a chat and that's fine. But ultimately, I think for really, really good hires, really good people in, in the industry, they, they want to work with people who really get what they're doing. So an example is customer success, which is you know, really quite a new field, um, very used now by B2B 
be SaaS, but it's quite a big step change and it's got to be organizational and it has to be you know, led by the CEO and you have to have that buy-in. So you kind of got to get it right. And, and then the other thing you feel is, because there's just so much to do even though we're still relatively small. And, and I think there's just kind of no excuse at this stage for getting it wrong. Uh, and you know, it's quite easy to say, oh, well, hold on, we'll sort this out where we're at 50 people or 100 people. But actually, if you want to get the kind of transformative leaders into the organization, you just got to do it yourself. And that, that means getting hands dirty. Richard, thank you so much for coming on the show and thank you for talking to us about scaling up. Thanks for having me, guys. Thank Cheers. you. Cheers.